Well, good morning and welcome to KMC. My name is Travis Capsha, and we're excited that you are joining us here for week two of our Meet Jesus series. It's going to run through Easter. Um, we just want to encourage you to invite anyone or uh, anyone that you know that needs to meet Jesus, and um, this would be a safe place for them to come and do so. Um, and we're excited again that you're here this morning. Some announcements. If you weren't here um, at the end of service last week for our meeting, uh, I have exciting news that James Amos is our new elder, and um, I just want you guys to encourage um, him and continue to pray for him and the elder board as a whole. Um, got some app news for you. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of rundown to make it a little bit easier for you guys. So if you head over to the App Store, the Google Play Store, you will find this app, which is the Church by Ministry One. It will look like this purple little box with a cross in it. Once you download this app, you will then type in Kalamazoo Missionary Church and it will be like this. When you click on Calvary Missionary Church, it will ask you to join. You will do so. There you'll find uh, three tabs along the bottom. First is giving. Um, when you click on this continue, it will bring you to our new uh, giving site, and you can set up an account there, and you can do your giving right on the app. Next to that, you have a contact us. Um, this is for um, new people. If they want to send their contact information, so we can put it in our system. But you also notice in the top right, it says prayers. So if you have a prayer request, I know we have a line going, but if, if you have a prayer request, shoot us one. It will, it'll go to Joel and I, and um, we can respond to those appropriately. And then the last one is a sermons tab. Um, you will find all of our previous sermons here, but they will also be live streamed to this app. More things will be coming to this app as we work on it, but this is what we got right now. So we encourage you to download that. Um, if you also want to head over to our YouTube page, um, subscribe there, then we can do awesome things on that platform. And while you're online, um, if the app is too much, head over to kzumc.org. There will also be a give button there, and you'll find our sermons live streamed and archived there as well. We have youth tonight from 5 to 6.30. Um, we encourage any 6th to 12th graders to join us, and we'd love to have you there. Um, and again, I just pray that you meet Jesus here this morning. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Kalamazoo Missionary Church. I am glad you're here this morning. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here along with Travis, and I'm thrilled that you guys have chosen to be here this morning. Join us for those who are here in person. For those who are watching online, we are absolutely thrilled that you are joining us uh, as well. So thank you so much for making us a part of your day. And we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to worship God. That is what we do here on Sunday mornings. We worship God. And we do it in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different ways to worship God. We do it through teaching from his word. Uh, we do it through singing. We do it through giving. Uh, we could do it through prayer. So we're going to do all those things this morning. So I want to encourage you uh, for the next hour or so to do your very, very best to lay aside any earthly cares that you have and to devote yourself fully and completely to the Lord. Does that sound all right? All right. So let's start things off uh, doing that this morning. Start things off by declaring his word uh, as we read together uh, the uh, responsive reading from Psalm 9. Uh, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the people with equity. The Lord is a, is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Let's pray this morning. Almighty God, you have brought us here today safely. We ask that you preserve us with your mighty power. Help us to not fall into sin today or be overcome by adversity. In all we do today, Lord, we ask that you help us to fulfill your purpose for us. 
Be with us this morning as we worship you. And as we look into your word this morning, Lord, I ask that you open our minds to its meaning, that you open our hearts to your message, and that you open our spirits to where you're leading us, Lord. And we pray all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, this morning, we are going to continue in our sermon series that we've uh, started last week called Meet Jesus. And what we've been doing is we've been, we, we, or what we're going to do and what we did last week in, is we are looking at stories from Jesus's life. And through those stories, we're learning about who he is and about who he wants his followers to be. And I, I think one of the things that we can be guilty of, and, and I know I have fallen into this from time to time in the past, is that we can know a whole lot of stuff about Jesus, right, without really knowing him as a person. Uh, so over the next few weeks, we're going to spend time just getting to know Jesus, looking at some of the things that he did, looking at some of the things that he said. And in doing so, my hope is that we'll all come to love him and learn about more about him. Uh, we began last week, uh, we looked at the story of Jesus being baptized and, and how immediately after that uh, he was tested by Satan, right? And prevailing uh, through that testing, he, he, he went out into the community, he began to preach the kingdom of God was near and people needed to repent of their sins and come to believe in Jesus who was the good news of salvation. And through those actions we learn that Jesus has the power to overcome any enemy. We, we learn that Jesus himself was the good news of God and that he ushered God's kingdom on to earth. And, and I thought those were some pretty, pretty cool things uh, to learn about Jesus. And we're going to learn a lot more about him through the story we're going to look at this morning. And we're gonna, the story we're going to be looking at is in Mark chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, please open them to Mark chapter 8. And while you're doing that, I want to give you a little bit of context to sort of set up this story. Uh, at this point in Jesus' ministry, he had been traveling around to different towns, uh, preaching about the kingdom of God, telling people to repent, miraculously healing people from illnesses, driving demons out of people. And as he was doing that, naturally, he began to earn some notoriety. He began to become famous. Uh, people began to recognize uh, what he was doing, the things he was saying, uh, and, and they began to talk about him. And they were talking about the things he was saying. They were talking about the things that he was doing as far as the healing people and the casting out demons and, and all of that stuff. And people were starting to realize that this Jesus guy was doing some things that ordinary people simply cannot do, right? And somehow, in some way, and they weren't really quite sure yet, but somehow, in some way, Jesus was special, was special. And, and those who were closest to him saw more of the stuff that he was doing than anyone and heard more uh, about, from him about what he was saying. And so, in, in Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 27, Jesus asked his closest followers, he says, well, who do people say that I am? Just kind of wanting to gauge the temperature of the room, right? Now, in the culture that Jesus was from, there was an idea, there was a, a, a hope, a thought, a, a dream that the people had, and, uh, and that dream was called Messiah. That hope was called Messiah. It was a person uh, who would be a savior, a person who would be a deliverer. And the Bible has a lot to say about this figure of the Messiah. And, and he was supposed to come and free Israel in their time of need. He was supposed to be a deliverer to uh, usher God's people into a golden age where they would be prevalent in the world and no longer under the thumb of foreign oppressors. And the anticipation for this figure, the anticipation for this Messiah was huge in the first century because Israel as a nation politically was under the authority of Rome and they were feeling the weight of that very much so. 
And Jesus, Jesus had all the earmarks of this Messiah. He was, he was powerful, right? As evidenced by the miracles that he performed. Obviously, he was sent by God. He preached a message about a new kingdom, about God's kingdom. So as Jesus was going around healing people and sharing the good news, his followers began to think that, that just maybe, just maybe, he might be the one. Just maybe Jesus might be the Messiah. And they began to start thinking that, and they began to start believing that. And so in verse 29 of Mark chapter 8, one of Jesus' closest follower, his name was Peter, responded to Jesus' question and said, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. Now from that point on in the Gospel of Mark, and we see this in the other Gospels as well, Jesus begins, there's a turning point. From that point on, he begins to explain to his followers exactly what being the Messiah entails. They've identified him as such. He's going to say, okay, I am the Messiah. Let me tell you exactly what that means. And it's from there we pick up our story this morning in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, where it says this. It says, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke plainly about this. You see, one of the things that had been overlooked by people in the first century about the Messiah is what the Bible had to say about how the Messiah would bring victory to God's people through suffering. Right? That was there in the Old Testament, but they didn't pick up on it. And that makes sense, right? You can understand that. You know, it's, it's, it's illogical that someone would bring victory through suffering. That's just not how victory is normally obtained. And Jesus began to correct that mistake here with his disciples and with his followers, uh, he began to tell them that he would soon be killed and that he would come back to life. Not a normal claim, right? Right? Even for someone saying they're the Messiah, it seems a little far-fetched that they're going to be killed and come back to life. And it says he spoke plainly about this. Right? See, previously when he had taught and talked about the kingdom of God, he had done it through parables and through stories. That, that the reason behind that, meaning he wanted the people listening him to think about what it really meant to be part of the kingdom of God. But here, he's just flat out saying that he was going to be tortured and killed by the leaders of the Jewish people. That was his future. And Peter, probably Jesus' closest follower, the person who spent more time with Jesus at, at Jesus' side during his ministry than anyone else responds what I think in, in a very interesting way. It says this. It says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. See, Jesus was telling them what was going to happen, and Peter didn't like it, right? So he, he, he kind of takes Jesus by the shoulder. He says, hey, hey Jesus, come on over here for a second. We need, to, we need to have a little chat, and just so the others can't hear us real quick. But I was, I was wondering, Jesus, maybe, have you really thought through what you just said? Right? Have you really thought it through? Because you said that you were going to die, Right? And, and we already talked about how you were the Messiah, and everybody knows, right, everybody knows that the Messiah is not tortured and killed. Rather, the Messiah, he, the Messiah raises up an army and sends the Romans packing. That's his job, right? So, so Jesus, I'm thinking that since you're the Messiah and you're going to need an army, it might be bad for morale if you start telling people you're going to die, right? 
So, because it's hard for people to follow a dead guy, right? That was Peter. Peter was having, I think, the same problem that many of us have with Jesus, and that the things that Jesus was saying simply didn't make sense according to how the world around us works. And Peter, like many of us, felt that it was his duty, like often we feel like it is our duty, to let Jesus know exactly how and why he was wrong. I find that response very interesting and somewhat harsh. But if you think Peter's response to Jesus was harsh, take a look at what Jesus says back to Peter. It says, but when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. See, Jesus refers to Peter as Satan. And, and I think he does that for, for, it could be any number of reasons, but one of the reasons I think he does that is because when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, like we read last week, this was the exact same thing that Satan was doing to Jesus. See, Satan tempted Jesus by saying Jesus could have the world worship him without having to go through the pain and the humiliation of the cross. And Peter here is saying the same thing. Jesus, we still want you to be Messiah. You can still be the Messiah, and you don't have to go to the cross. Don't talk like that. See, Peter loved Jesus, and he didn't want bad things to happen to him. And he had Jesus' best interests in mind. So the problem is, is that it was exactly the opposite of what God had in mind. And see, Jesus knew that if he was going to bring salvation to his good friend Peter, and if he was going to bring salvation to all of us, then he was going to have to have the courage to go to the cross and to die for us. It was the only way that God had made for us to be reconciled to him. And though it seems harsh to us, and we don't want Jesus to have suffered for us, the simple truth is that without that suffering, every one of us would be lost. Jesus knew that because his focus was on what God wanted and not what he may have wanted for himself. And I also find it incredibly interesting that, that, that Peter was trying to make this a private conversation, right? He was trying to make it a conversation just between him and Jesus. But Jesus immediately turns around and includes the rest of his disciples in the response. He wanted to make sure that none of his other followers make the same mistake that Peter was making. And not only that, not only does he include all of his disciples in his response to Peter, but he turns this whole episode into one of those teachable moments for the whole crowd that's there, right? You guys know what I'm talking about when it's a teachable moment? You've ever had that with your kids? Teachable moment? We, we had a few of those, right? Uh, he turns it, this whole thing into a teachable moment for the crowd that was nearby. Verse 34, it says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If, if anyone, I find this verse very interesting and convicting. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them 
when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. See, Jesus goes from rebuking Peter, turns towards the crowd, and says, Look, all of you, if you want to be my disciples, you must do three things. Number one, you must deny yourself. Number two, you must take up your cross. And number three, you must follow me. And it's here that we get to the crux of the matter. There is a cost to following Jesus. And he demands certain things from his followers. And this is not a secret. He is very upfront about it. The first thing he says is that you must deny yourself. Now this is something that has been greatly misconstrued over the years. Denying yourself does not mean some sort of asceticism, uh, which is denying yourself things. That's not what he's talking about. Say, for example, uh, you are someone who likes scrapbooking, right? I don't know if anyone here likes scrapbooking. I do not, but I, I know others do. Right, Some, Someone here who likes scrapbooking. If that's something that brings you joy and allows you to hang out with friends and builds community with other people, denying yourself does not mean that you stop scrapbooking. Right? And just spending time and alone reading your Bible and suffering for Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. The other way that this term has been misunderstood is that denying yourself... Uh, a lot of people think that denying yourself means that I have to put in place a lot of self-disciplines so that I do godly things on a regular basis. That is also what he is not talking about here. And those things aren't necessarily bad. It's just not the message that Jesus is giving us. What Jesus is saying is that if you want to be his disciple, then you have to not think about yourself at all. You have to not think about yourself at all. It simply means that you put God first and think of him rather than yourself when you are confronted with life's choices. And this works out in a lot of different ways, right? If, if you're someone who struggles with pride, it, it, it means that you need to give up your desire for status and your desire for honor. If, if you're someone who, who struggles with being greedy, it means that you need to deny yourself your, your, your craving for wealth. If, it's, if you're someone who is, is violent, it means that you need to deny yourself uh, your, your, your need for revenge or your, your self-righteous choices in, in being violent towards others. And the list goes on. Right? If there is something in your life that stops you from giving all of yourself over to Jesus, that is what you need to deny yourself. Denying yourself means giving over to Jesus every single piece of your character that would drive you away from him. That's denying yourself. That sounds hard, doesn't it? That just sounds hard. But wait, there's more, right? In addition to denying yourself, Jesus says that in order to be his disciple, you have to take up your cross. Right? So taking up your cross means that we need to be self-sacrificing. And this does not mean that Jesus is inviting his disciples here to try out taking up a cross. Uh, and see if it fits. He's, he's not saying that he's looking for volunteers to carry a cross for bonus points in your relationship with him. Rather, Jesus is demanding that those who would follow him become like Jesus and live out the cross in their lives. To take up the cross means that you enter into suffering with Jesus. It represents the aspects of our society that would look upon your faith and oppose it and punish you 
for it. And it's in those moments when we come face to face with taking up our cross that we really find out how, how deep our commitment to Jesus is. Are we willing to lose something in order to faithfully represent our commitment to Christ? Are we willing to go through persecution and maintain our faith in Jesus like so many of our Christian brothers and sisters do all across the world on a daily basis? Taking up your cross means that no matter what, you are Jesus's, and you are willing to give up everything to follow him, even your life if need be. That sounds hard too, doesn't it? The final demand that Jesus has for his followers is simply that they follow him. And as, as we look at the story of Jesus' life, we see that his purpose was to give his life for other people. He demonstrated a self-sacrificing love that has never been matched. He told us that the greatest thing that we can do is to love, to love God and to love each other. And he's not talking about a touchy-feely, happy, let's all uh, join together around a campfire kind of fellowship kind of love. That is not at all what he's talking about here. It, he's talking about a love that is willing to do whatever it takes to put each other in a position to be closer to God. A love that says, no matter what, I am on your side. A love that opens the eyes of the people around us to the possibility that God is real and that God cares about them. We need to make love our calling card. When, when people think of us, they should think of love. That's how Jesus did it. And if we are to follow him, that's how we need to do it. Jesus' demands from his followers are extreme, aren't they? They cannot be followed in a by a casual admirer of who Jesus is. They cannot be followed by a Sunday morning Christian. Rather, they can only be met if a person is willing to change everything about themselves in order to embrace the new life that Jesus has for them. Following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It takes an incredible amount of courage, and it is worth it every step of the way. The life you will have with Christ is so much more than the life you will have without him. And if you have never done so, I would encourage you to commit yourself to him today. See, in order to do that, we have to follow in his footsteps. See, we learn today about Jesus that he accepted the plan that God had for his life. He had no desire to die on the cross, yet he knew it was God's will, and he was willing to trust God even through those horrible circumstances. We also learn about Jesus that he is committed to the truth. It is not easy to tell people you care about hard things, like he did with Peter and like he did with his disciples. Yet he didn't shy away from sharing with them where the road they were on would take them. Because it was the truth. And because the most loving thing he could do was to tell them the truth. Another thing that we learn from Jesus from this story is that he is absolutely uncompromising. He is uncompromising. Jesus offers grace to each one of us. 
He is willing to forgive us of our sins if we turn our lives over to him. But once we do that, we need to realize that he is our Lord from that point forward. We no longer have control over our lives, but we have placed that control in his hand. We are not to think of ourselves. We are to expect suffering and persecution from those around us, and we are to sacrificially love those people to the point of death. That is what it means to follow Jesus and is what he expects and what he demands from each one of us. A lot of stuff. Some just makes me wonder, makes me wonder, how are we doing at being his disciple? How are you doing? I, I look at this list and I'm intimidated. Right? I, I, it's hard to do. But I also look at this list and I get excited. I get excited because I imagine how great my life could be if I continue to work on these things. And though I know that I fall short of his expectations on a regular basis, on a daily basis, I fall short of his expectations, I take comfort in the final thing that we learn about Jesus from this story, and that is that he is compassionate. He says here at the end, he says that he will be ashamed of those who are ashamed of him. But that means that there will be a group of people who he's not ashamed of. People who he'll be proud to call his followers when the day of judgment comes. Yes, following Jesus is hard, but the offer to do so is open to each and every one of us. Jesus looks at who we are, he looks at where we're at, and he loves each one of us for who we are and, and where we're at. And he offers us the opportunity to follow him. And as we follow him, as we start going down that path, he will help us to learn how to deny ourselves. And, and he will give us the strength to take up our cross. And he will continually teach us how to love other people. And I, I take great comfort in the fact that although following Jesus is demanding, because of his compassion and his love for me, it doesn't demand perfection. So I have a question for each of you this morning. Same question I asked last week, same question I'm gonna ask next week. Now that you've heard a little bit about who Jesus is, would you like to follow him? Would you like to enter into God's kingdom? Are you willing to take up your cross? Are you willing to deny yourself? Are you willing to love others? If Jesus is, is someone who you want in your life, then I want to just take a minute and guide you through a prayer that will begin your relationship with him. If everybody can bow your head, and, and this will be for those who have never had a relationship with Jesus before. This is how we start the process. Father, this morning, just pray with me silently. Father, this morning I come to you, and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I repent of my wrongdoing, and I believe that Jesus is the Son of God that he ushered in God's kingdom and that through him I can begin a new life that honors you and that is committed to him. God, I know that this is not an easy road, but I'm willing to walk down it in order to be with you. Thank you, Lord, for my new life. I pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now, if you pray that prayer for the first time, then you have just entered into God's kingdom and he is rejoicing over you because he loves you and he wants to be with you and he's thankful that you have turned back to him. And if you've done that, then please let me know. Just quietly afterwards. It doesn't have to be in front of everybody else. I mean, we're not looking to embarrass anybody. Let me know. I'd love to hear about any step you've taken towards Christ this morning. Let's pray again, all of us together, and just let God know how much we love him. And then from there, we'll head into our time of worship today. Father God, we're so grateful for our time together this morning to be with you, to, to express our love to you, to worship you. And Lord, sometimes your word tells us things that we don't necessarily like to hear tells us things like there are, there's a cost to following you. It tells us things like you demand certain things from us as your followers. And we find that scary, Lord. We find that intimidating. So Lord, I ask that you bless us this morning with courage. I ask that you uh, bless us with your presence. I ask that you be continue to be with us as we worship. I ask that you help us to live out these things in our lives. Help us to deny ourselves and focus on you. Help us to endure persecution. Help us to love each other this week. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us for our service this morning. Uh, if you want to head over to the App Store or the Google Play Store and download Church by Ministry One, there you'll find a Kalamazoo Missionary Church where you can set up giving, uh, contact and send prayer requests, and also find our sermons live streamed and archived there. That'd be awesome. Also head over to our YouTube page, subscribe there, like and share this video, and then also kzumc.org. You can find sermons um, and a place to uh, tithe. Um, we just encourage you guys um, to just engage with us online as this as COVID has changed things, uh, online church is going to be more important, and we're thankful that you joined us this morning. We have youth from 5 to 6.30 here at the church, and I pray that you met Jesus this morning. And I just, as an encouragement, as we end this service, um, we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him daily. We'll see you all next week. Bye, guys.